she didn't feel good, so she has, um, as you wonder where she is, she's not here um, because of that. I'd ask you to open your Bibles this morning with me. Um, is this thing on? Um, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3. Nehemiah, chapter 3, we're beginning there. And you're going to find there in Nehemiah that speaks of the horse gate that was being repaired and built and restored in the city of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's time. And we've taken a journey through the gates. And we dealt with some of that in Bible exploration this morning. So to, to be repeating again that, we've taken the journey through the gates. And every gate of the city is an experience that we must, as believers, we must walk through, we must pass through in our journey to maturity. Every one of us wants to grow up in God. We're not going to remain infants forever. There's a benefit to being an infant. Right? You have to do very little for yourself and everything comes to you. So how many of you want to be infants all your life? Based on that definition, yes, please, right? But it is inevitable. Everything that grows, every person that grows in God, moves from the life of an infant, from that of a child, and goes into maturity to be able to do and carry more responsibility in the things that God has called them to. We, we looked at, for starting the, the horse gate, we looked at Psalm 78, verse 9. And this psalm is a, is a wonderful psalm. I encourage you to read it because there is so much powerful prayer information. If you want to know how to pray, you can pray this psalm. But here... Sort of about a third of the way in the psalm, I believe, is verse 9. And it has this statement, The warriors of Ephraim, though armed with bows, some translations say, though they were sharpshooters, though they were trained for battle, they were skilled with a bow. Though they were armed with bows, turned their backs and fled on the day of battle. I think about that scripture because it is so dangerous that when the pressure comes and the heat is on, that we do not engage in battle. And we spoke about it, or at least we sh I shared this morning in Bible exploration a bit about that, that sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between the evil spirits that we have to deal with and people that are being used by the spirits to implement things. I don't think we can, we have any question that Nazi Germany during the Second World War was ruled by evil and evil spirits and that all that was done by Hitler and his armies and his generals and those that were the SS and those who were in command was pure evil. But in the light of that terrible thing, the most awful thing happened is that 
Christians, good people. felt that they could not say anything and then did not say anything and did not stand up because it became more and more dangerous to do so because in the time that it mattered most, they did not engage in battle. And I believe that we again are living in a time like that when it matters most for many reasons that we need not be silent. First of all, we need not be silent to speak to and rebuke the spirits that are creating havoc in our society and in our culture, but also that when the opportunity arises and that there is a chance to speak to power, to speak to situations that we do. Because in the day of battle, we must not turn our backs to the enemy. Because when the stakes are the highest, it is often the case that people are the quietest. And it takes each one of us to stand up. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. These words we know so well. If you ever want to talk about spiritual warfare, you're going to, you can hardly do it without going to Ephesians chapter 6 and these verses. And so we're going to read them together. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles is a King James Version for the tricks and the trickery. Satan will rarely come to you with a forward thing. Say, listen, listen to, listen to me, Winston, I, I have a proposition for you. Um, and this is it. Everything I'm going to tell you right now is a lie. But don't worry about it. Because it's going to feel good. It's going to seem good. So don't just hear me out. Make a decision. No, he comes and he doesn't tell you that he's a liar. He doesn't tell you that he's tricking you. He doesn't tell you that he's baiting and switching. He doesn't tell you that what he's doing is he's, is he is changing the word of God, that he's twisting the words of God, that he's twisting and, and altering situations so that it will seem and sound like it is something that you prefer, that you want, and that actually it is something you will choose. For Eve, he made it that the fruit looked good to eat. He made it that the fruit seemed pleasant. But Eve knew what God had said. So, watch out for the tricks of the devil. For we wrestle not. When I think of that, I think I've preached this before in terms of, of Psalm 78 verse 9. Let it not be said that the church of Jesus Christ took on this term of the statement, we wrestle not. We will not wrestle, in other words. We will not fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let it not be said that we refuse to wrestle, that we refuse to take on the fight that is in front of us. A little bit from last week, we saw first of all that we wrestle against principalities and that describes the hierarchy. It tells us that our enemy is structured and organized 
into a hierarchy of spirits, there is something that we have to deal with. Now I don't tell you this, I don't share this with you, so that you can be fearful of the enemy, but it is so that you will understand the way the enemy comes against you, and that he might fear because you know his structure, his hierarchy, and you know how he is going to function against you. But the enemy is structured and organized into a hierarchy of ruling spirits. And these spirits function over jurisdictions, over areas, and we are to understand that. For instance, that there are spirits that rule over this region in which you live. Some of you don't live here in Walpole, but over Walpole there are very distinct spirits that rule and create havoc and create the, and try to produce the same kind of outcomes all the time. And what we're saying by doing spiritual battles, we say these outcomes, these, these predictable ways of the culture and the attitude the spirit of a Walpole are no longer acceptable to the people of God. They're no longer something that we will stand for. They're no longer something that we will, we will sit by and watch happen. But we will engage the enemy. We'll rebuke the spirits. We'll bind them in the name of Jesus. And we'll declare Jesus as Lord over Walpole. You can do that over your town, over your region, over your neighborhood. You can walk your streets and say, these streets belong to the Lord. You can go down to, to um, Joshua and you can say, Lord, it is so that every place where I, my feet shall tread, Lord, you have said you have given them to me. So, Lord, I'm walking these streets. I'm walking this neighborhood. And I'm declaring that Jesus is Lord in this place. You don't have to go necessarily yelling at demons. You just have to go declaring Jesus Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus reigns and rules in these streets, in this city, in this town, in this church. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That's where it begins. Second, we were told... And we looked at that, that we are involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat, wrestling against powers. And the Greek word there is exousia, and it is to do with um, authorities. Authorities. We receive power. We receive this Exousia, and we receive authority through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, and if you do not have the evidence of speaking in tongues, I want to encourage you that you begin to seek the Lord, especially in this week of prayer and fast, begin to seek the Lord. You don't have to be special. You don't have to do special things. You don't have to... to, to um, to wait for a special move of God, to be filled with the Spirit, you just have to be willing and saying, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And He will, and when He fills you with His Holy Spirit, He will bring to you authority over the enemy. He will bring to you this power over the enemy. You will not stand alone. You will not be alone. You will not be defenseless against the enemy if you will Seek the Lord and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if for those of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who speak in tongues, we can declare and we can use that, that language, that voice, to praise the Lord, to worship the Lord, and to engage in the battle. It's communication that the enemy cannot intercept. Right? One of the great dangers in battle is that somewhere the enemy will find the encryption code and be able to decipher the message.
messages from one army to another and they'll have specific intel to be able to crush the enemy, to meet them at the pass, to find them in their weakest, most vulnerable spot. But for us as believers, as we, as we participate in our prayer language, as we pray, as we seek the Lord and we communicate with the Lord, it is a language that the enemy cannot intercept. He cannot encrypt. He cannot understand it because it is between us our spirit and the Holy Spirit that we are in communication. Jesus has equipped us with both authority and power to deal with the enemy. Quick look at Luke 9 1, and we'll go on to today's lesson. Then he called these 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all the devils and to cure diseases. He has given you power and authority over all the devils. Did you know that? You know that, that there were times in Africa where we were praying for people who were demon possessed. And you're driving out a spirit from that person and that spirit will try in any way and in many ways to distract you, to intimidate you, to freak you out, so to speak. But you've got to remember that you have power and you have authority over every evil spirit and you will not allow yourself to be intimidated because you have the authority. You have the ability to stand up and drive that demon out. Now in America, there's not too many times when we deal with demonic spirits. doesn't mean that they're not here. It doesn't mean that people aren't filled with evil spirits, that aren't governed by spirits, and that they do not need to be driven out of people. Exorcism, driving out spirits, is still a biblical thing. It's still a necessary thing. It goes by all kinds of names today, but it is still something that needs to be dealt with. Do not think that it is something that just belongs to a primitive world. It is much more hidden, much more actively at work in the, in the hidden sphere in the modern world than in the primitive world, if you want to say. In Africa, the demons just show themselves. In America, they hide. But they still need to be driven out. They still need to be exposed for the evil that they want to do. But remember, you have both power and authority over them. Remember, I described it last time as a police officer who, when they get up in the morning, they put the uniform. I was thinking about this, that the little badge they call, they don't call it a badge. They call it a shield. They put on their shield, and that'll preach all by itself, but that speaks of their authority. They put it on the uniform, and when a police officer comes in their civilian uniforms, they have to, they have to prove and identify that they are even a police officer out of uniform. But when they're in uniform, they don't hardly have to. Right? Their uniform tells you that they have authority. But in case you don't get it, the policeman, after he's put on his uniform or her uniform, straps to their waist. A belt and on that belt there's a gun, there's a taser and there's a stick and those are the power of the policeman. If you will not obey the authority they will use the power. But as believers we have both authority the enemy knows it so we should know it better And remember, the enemy is a lawless spirit. He does not 
always want to obey instructions. And so, in those times, you will need both the authority, the right to engage him, and the power to deal with him. So today, the third we learn is that we wrestle against rulers of the darkness of this world. Rulers of the darkness of this world. This Greek word, um, it's a long Greek word and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I'll say it, but it's translated as lords of the world or princes of this age. What we learn here is the intention of the enemy is to control as a God in this world, this world. Now in, in the previous message I shared that the one thing about the enemy when he's spoken of as a God of this world, the one thing that he wants more than anything else is he wants to receive worship. He wants to receive worship in any kind of way, any form of adoration, any form of connection. The enemy wants to receive it. It's not just through music. It's not just through, through um, that kind of thing. The enemy wants worship. He wants adoration. And he wants complete submission of all that serve him. But he doesn't demand complete submission immediately. He will take it gradually. He will take it over time. He will trap, he will trick, and he seeks to destroy in every area that he can. You see, when Adam fell through sin, Satan gained dominion, the dominion that was given to Adam, Adam relinquished to the enemy. But when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus was the last Adam. Jesus took back what Adam relinquished and defeated Satan at Calvary. So we're not living in a time where, where we see the enemy as all-powerful, having all position and authority but we're seeing a defeated enemy that is still intimidating, still pushing, and still in the throes of power. It's time to put the enemy out of our lives. He is stripped of his power and his kingdom. And since we are in Christ, we have the right, that is the authority and the power, to treat him as a trespasser. He does not need to be welcomed. He does not need to be provided a space. He does not need to be given a place to exist in our lives. In, and personally, he has no right to live in the believer's life under in a believer's house. He doesn't have the right to live in a church. He doesn't have the right to live in a town or a city or an area or a nation unless he is given that right by the people. Unless the people invite him in, he does not. And so when we fail to treat him as a trespasser, as an unwelcome guest, as someone and something that must be sent out, that must be cast away, unless we, we fail to see it that way, we will allow him in. We will give him permission. And he will use permission in terms of authority. And when someone comes to your house and they <clears throat> they visiting you might say to them, well, help yourself to what's in the refrigerator. 
You know, just go find what you need, and that's okay. But you will not have somebody simply knock on your door and say, well, can I come in? You'll say, well, who are you? I don't, well, come on in. Help yourself to what's in the refrigerator, in the pantry. You know, just go sit down on the couch, make yourself at home, right? But that's what happens to the enemies. We, we say, make yourself at home. When I grew up, there was a joke about that. Say, someone says, well, they, they say, come on in and make it out, make out as if this is your home. And then the joke would be, oh, well, what I'm, I like this home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call an estate agent and I'm going to put it on the market and sell it tomorrow. Is that what you meant? No, that's not what they meant, but that's what the enemy takes it as. You invited him in, he has come to take over. Now, we're not going to talk about so many ways that we can invite the enemy in today. But remember, he will find every means and method that he can. But demon spirits have no legal rights to believers. And if you want to know if demon spirits have, have been operating and functioning and terrorizing and bugging and irritating you, then look Simply go and look and read the fruit of the Spirit and say, Lord, is this fruit in my life or is there a problem here? Because they will try to interrupt the fruitfulness of your life. You will know that they're present there. You can look at 1 Corinthians 13 and you can see like, oh, love does, love does, love does not. And you will know that if there are contradictions to that, that the enemy is trying to short circuit what God has given and done in your life. And it's time to step up, stand up, and speak to the enemy and say, You will not function in this house. You know, it doesn't matter so much of how he came in, but it does matter that he's not staying. Now, it might be necessary to figure out how he came in because that, that, that might be a legal opening to him that you have provided through sin, through deceit, through, through habits, through, through behaviors that you have. But if they don't match the fruit of the Spirit and they do not match what love does and what love is, then you can simply say, and get out of here, and I close the window to the opposite of what God has said. I hope that's helpful this morning, because what we need is we need some practical advice on how to deal with the enemy. You see, they may try to trespass, but when we are ready to take the initiative, we give them notice and say, get out. You are not welcome in this place. Jesus explained his ability to cast out demons in these words in Luke chapter 11 verse 20 to 22. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods, are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him, and in this case, this stronger is Jesus, and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. That is Luke 11, 20 to 22. Jesus told us that the strong man's armor was taken away from him. Satan is made holy and completely defenseless. And we know that this expression of the armor is, is, 
is a Greek word that shows up only one other place in the New Testament. And it is used in the statement or the phrase that is translated in Ephesians 6, where it says, take on the whole armor of God. This is the only place that that word is used again in the New Testament. So what, what we have here is this contrast, that the enemy was armored, he had his armor, he had his protection, he had his weapons, but Jesus, the stronger man, came and and disarmed him, took away his weapons, took away his armor, and spoiled his house, took away all his goods. Everything that was his is no longer his. And then, Paul writes and says, put on the whole armor of God. Enemies defenseless and the believer is armored, has his armor on, and is able to stand against the wiles of the devil, able to defend himself, able to protect from the attacks of the enemy. But yet all this time, we are led to believe that we should be intimidated by the enemy. It's time that we understand where things have fallen for the believer. You see, the believer who has put on the whole armor of God is completely defended and protected and the enemy is completely vulnerable see Satan still wants to rule in this world and it does seem like he is made and he is making considerable progress and there are some believers who cheer on the progress of the enemy simply and they quote scriptures and say, well, in the last days it's going to be like this, and so this has to happen for it to be the last days. I will not give the enemy an inch. And I'll not back down until my final breath. Because though there are things that happen in the last days, I want to say as a watchman, over the city of God, not on my watch, not in my day, not in my time. I want to declare that the enemy has no rights, he has no permission, he has no authority, and he will not trespass. And I encourage you to do the same over your life, over this body of believers that we say enough is enough. You see, we are coming to a knowledge and the strategy of the enemy. We're coming to understand how he functions. We're coming to understand that we have spiritual weapons and that they are powerful, they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. They are, they are weapons that are able to do amazing, powerful things. And we need to use them in the offensive to the enemy. We are not just to simply stand by and let the enemy run over us. More Christians must enter into warfare. Because those who enter into the warfare get to have the spoils. And in the scripture, in Luke chapter 11, verse 22... It says, all his armor, which he trusted in, and divides his spoils. The spoils of the enemy do not belong to the enemy. Do not think 
That all the riches of this world, all the, the wonders of the earth, all the amazing things that, that have been accomplished by, by people that God has put on this earth belong to the enemy. The spoils belong to the people of God. I know that has to be processed. Because it's so contrary to what we have, we have come to believe, to what we've understood. We believe that, that the enemy comes in. He is the stronger man. He spoils the house. He takes the spoils for himself and he floats it all over the world and says, Look, this is what it is. But it's time for us to know that, that the enemy is not the stronger man. That Jesus is the stronger man. And he has come and he has left the enemy defenseless. And he... He has, he has put in his armor on the people of God so they are, un, they are not vulnerable, but they can stand and in, take the spoils from the enemy. But we said when we hear this, we think, oh, that sounds too fanciful, too far-fetched, too impossible to imagine. And that is exactly how the enemy comes in and keeps us quiet to the point where we turn our backs in the day of battle. Aren't you tired, because I am, of hearing how the enemy keeps winning every day? Turn on the news, Fox News, CNN, doesn't matter. Find your channel. And you're going to sit and listen to it. And you're going to hear things like, Oh, Satan's having his way again. Satan's having his way over there. Satan's having his way over here. Satan's doing this. And Satan's doing that. All bad news is good news for the enemy. When we listen to the news, you can do what I do, and God help me that I stop doing it, I can go in a complaining session. These people, these things, and if I get spiritual and I can say, Satan is doing this and that. Glorifying the enemy. I can go into a time of prayer and intercession and say, No, I bind these spirits in the name of Jesus. Lawlessness, I bind you in the name of Jesus. You shall not function. You will not have control over the cities of this land. Lawlessness, you will not have the ability to speak even in high places in government. I bind you in the name of Jesus. You shall be still, you shall be quiet. Take authority over you now, in Jesus' name. Spirit of death, you will not prevail in this nation. God is a God of life. He's come to give us life and life abundantly. And I speak that over the nation, over the people. And everything that speaks of death, everything that craves the death of the unborn or or the elderly, or anyone, I speak death to it in the name of Jesus, because life shall prevail. You want to capture our children in obscenities, I bind you in the name of Jesus. You will not function in our schools. You will not speak in our schools. You will be cast out in the name of Jesus. You begin to take authority. Not simply back down to the news and say, isn't that awful? How many of you do what I do, but want to do what I suggested that we all start doing? News should turn us into intercession, not to grumbling, not to complaining. All right? Sounds like you're thinking about it. Fourth and last 
is we look at with we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. The key phrase here is the word wickedness, which is highly injurious or destructive in character. That which has the heart and mind to destroy. John 10, 10, the first part of that verse, where Jesus says that He has come to give us life and life more abundantly, but the enemy has come for a very different thing. The enemy has come as a thief, to steal, as a murderer, to kill, and as a destroyer, to destroy everything in sight. You see the marks and the fingerprints of the enemy all over the news. But there is something that Jesus came to do and that He has come to give life. And He has come to give life abundantly. Begin to speak life into situations. But the enemy will masquerade as angels of light and by deception, they will trap many in their nets of destruction. The whole thing about a trap, for a trap to work, it doesn't, it must not look like a trap. It's got to... Be deceptive. It's got to be hidden. It's got to be alluring. When we were kids, we would trap birds. And there are two different ways that we would trap birds, just for the fun of catching them. Imagine that, right? We'd have this wire mesh cage and we would put it on the ground and we would put bird seed underneath it and then we would prop it up with a stick and we would tie a long string to the stick and then we would go lay down on the grass and wait for the birds to come. Now the birds would go after the seed and they would be happy that somebody has fed them. Somebody has provided them seed that they didn't have to go and forage for. They didn't have to go find in the field. It was there in abundance. Oh, but what they didn't know is that it was a trap. And we would tug on that string when there were enough of those birds underneath. And they would be trapped in that wire cage. And then they were ours to do whatever we wanted with them. The other way is we, would, we had a trap that had little cones, wire cones that go inside. We'd also believe this one you didn't have to watch. You could just leave it there. And the birds would go through the cones and they would get narrower and narrower until they were inside the, the trap. But then on the, when they wanted to go out, the hole seemed too small for them to leave. And so they stayed trapped in the cage. You see, either way, these birds did not know that it was a trap. They did not know the danger of it. They did not know that their life could be at stake if they entered into these things. And today when we warn People, we warn unbelievers and we warn believers that Satan is setting a trap for you and he wants to destroy your life. It is so often that people will say, oh, are you just trying to be controlling? Oh, are you just a legalist? Oh, are you just, you don't know. The Bible doesn't say that specifically. So God can't be against it. But when you give a solid warning of a danger, heed that warning. Do not simply turn around and say, Oh, you just don't want me to have fun. You just don't want me to enjoy my life. 
Satan will offer you free seed every day if you'll just step into his trap. Be careful. Be careful. The enemy is trying to trap you. He's trying to mislead you. And you can't see the trap for the seed. You can't see the trap for the bait. You just see the, you just see the allurements, but not the danger. That is the way the enemy works. You see, these wicked attempts of the enemy are to destroy your life. There's a lot of wickedness in this land. And not everything that this world has now become and began to call justice, because they, there's the term justice that is being used by the enemy. It's a, it's a spiritual term that has been twisted and misused in this land. And not everything that they call is justice is justice. Because when they, when they will, on the other side, allow great injustices, that's, that clearly the Word of God speaks against. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not do the things. And yet, policies in our nation allow injustice. Every day. And not every injustice is simple. They are complex. And in their complexities, people remain quiet. Climate justice is the latest one. With Earth Day, it was spoken all over the place. It's not justice. It's a trap. But the enemy uses these terms. But we can know that Satan wants to advance his kingdom. Demon powers are in strategic positions and they give an authority to control the world and fill it with evil, with wickedness. Much of what the world calls justice is pure evil and wickedness. You know, abortion is considered a right and it's considered to be just and right to allow the murder up to this time about 63 million, million children have died at the hands of this choice in this nation. And considered unjust to bring a stop to it. What is just in the world's eyes is a complete injustice and an evil in God's. And it is necessary for every believer to understand that. You see, there's no advantage for us to ignore Satan's forces, his powers, and his methods, because this only helps him to go undetected and sometimes unchallenged. To fail to become actively involved in spiritual warfare is to suggest that we do not care what becomes of us or our loved ones or our community or our nation and our world. And that's not true. We care. Because if it crumbles, it crumbles around us and it crumbles and it falls and fails and we're impacted too. You could be willing to fight 
fight the battle for pure selfish reasons. But they're even greater than your own self to pre preserve. We must engage in spiritual battle. Satan flaunts his power through witchcraft, through the occult, through false religion, cults as never before in human history. At least as long as we've known. You see, the church is being forced to re-examine its own resources because God is raising up a mighty army. We sang about that this morning. And we're going forth with spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For our war, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are not of the flesh, but mighty in God, divine authority, for pulling down, that means to demolish to the point of extinction strongholds, for the casting down, and that word means to demolish, and it, it is linked to the word dunamis. It is for the casting down, tear down, for the dynamiting of the structures of the enemy. The arguments, mighty in God, for pulling down of strongholds, casting down, Arguments and every, and that word every is all, high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, into the obedience of Christ. And that means to take captive in war, to subdue, to ensnare, and to make captive, and being ready to punish all disobedience. And there's a catch right here that is necessary for us to look at or think about to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Three strongholds. Imaginations, high things, proud obstacles, things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Rebellious thoughts that are not obedient to God. And there are so many, so many in this world that are rebellious to the nature and the notion and the idea even of God. And it's time for the believer to stand up and stand strong and say no I will not give an inch. I will not give away for the enemy to come into my life. But because of confusion, I'm close with this, in the day of battle, Christians disengage and turn their backs on the battle. People have been doing Satan's work for centuries and are still doing it. Darkness Darkness is a term that we use for the, for the enemy, for the work that has been done. But you know, darkness is, the, is not a thing in itself. Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. So darkness reigns where you and I do not come, where we do not come in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, where we do not enter in and say, here I am, I am a child of God, I am a city set on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden, I am here and therefore darkness, you must flee. And you know what? You don't have to, you don't come in a, in, in a building and flip the light switch, and then have to say, okay, darkness, out you go. As soon as light is present, darkness is gone. That is the power that God has given to every believer. 
And that when we come into a situation, when we enter into a, a place, we come by the authority of God. And light enters where darkness once prevailed. Christians are to enter the room and be the light that God has called them to be. You see, Revelation tells us that overcoming victory comes when we don't love our lives, our very lives, more than we love Christ. Love your life. Live your life. But not at the cost of your witness. Not at the cost of your ability to declare Jesus Lord over every situation. Let's not enter into a time of compromise. And if you have compromise in your life, then it's time to bring order and put things back in place because the, sat the enemy will use the compromise you made. He will treat that as an invitation. He will treat that as a welcome act. And he will come busting through your door. See, he doesn't have manners. Your front door, you might have a mat by the door. It might even say, welcome. But just because you put a welcome mat at your front door does not mean you don't lock your door. Come on. Just because you have a sign, a, a banner or something at your door that, that says welcome doesn't mean that you let anyone and everyone through that door as they wish and they please. You still monitor access. A thief and a robber will not be able to stand in a court of law and say, well, they had a welcome mat at their door. I knew I was welcome to come in and make myself at home. But Satan is a lawless spirit. And if he sees a welcome mat, he will come in and he will take over. Compromise is your welcome mat. And don't think the enemy has good manners because he does not. He's a thief, a murderer, and a destroyer of things. But, Jesus has come to give you life. Receive life today. Cast the enemy out, in Jesus' name. Let's stand this morning. We're going to just present ourselves to the Lord. We've seen that there are ways that the enemy works. And today I believe that we should make a clear decision and a choice that we will live as God has called us to live. And that we will live the abundant life that Jesus has come to give us. That we will walk and live in the victory that the cross and the finished work of the cross has provided for us. That is destroyed and put the enemy. 
and spoiled him, left him defenseless, and that we will begin to enjoy and participate in those spoils, that we will realize that we are, have the full armor of God, therefore we are not defenseless, and we are able to war against principalities, powers, rulers in high places, that we'll be able to stand up and say, enough is enough. And with me and the Word of God today in this decision, then let's just present ourselves to the Lord and say, this is a new day. This is a new day. Lord, we stand as soldiers in your army, ready to deliver battle to the enemy. Bring the fight to the enemy. We'll no longer be passive. We'll no longer stand by and just watch the destruction of families and of cities and regions. But we will engage the enemy because we say enough is enough. And this day is the last day because we are the light of the world. We are a city set on a hill. And we cannot be hidden. We drive out darkness because of the light of God within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Take the fight to the enemy. Don't wait for him to come to you. God bless you. And um, have a wonderful day. Try to stay dry out there.